to be playful. Blast processing. It was allegedly something that somehow made Sonic the Hedgehog go faster. Undoubtedly, I think Sonic was a system seller for Sega. As a mascot back then, it, it was just huge. And this hedgehog helped stir up some headlines. Mario the comparisons began. It became Nintendo versus Sega, and the media wanted to compare them. The lack of long-term success of the Dreamcast was kind of a disappointment. In some ways, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think everyone was a bit shocked at first that, that Nintendo and Sega had finally joined forces since they were mortal enemies for 10, 15 years. I'd like to change. I'd like to move forward. Meet the man behind Sonic, Yuji Naka. He has lots of childlike qualities, which I think translates into his games. My Lotus. The Yuji Naka story begins on the other side of the world. Well, when I was a child, I grew up in a place in Japan called Osaka up until I was 18. In terms of creativity, I like many things. I like cars, games, theme parks, everything. It's from all these things that I've been influenced. Well, I don't think I was too smart. I wasn't able to go to college. So after graduating from high school, I had to look for a job, and there were many candidates I targeted. They weren't looking for people, whereas Sega was. I lived in Osaka, and I wanted to move to Tokyo. So I applied to Sega, and they took me. The 18-year-old entrepreneur goes to work on his first game for Sega, a game company already established thanks to arcade titles like Zaxxon. 1984 was when I joined Sega. Girls' Garden was the first game I was involved with. I was a programmer. It was the first game I worked on for the SG-1000. In 1986, Sega introduces a brand new console, the Sega Master System. Naka works on games like F-16 Fighting Falcon. The Master System, I thought at the time, you know, back then I certainly wasn't working in the game industry. I was just a you know, kid playing video games like everyone else. But I felt that that box, the level of sophistication that it kind of oozed out of it was just a lot cooler than like Atari or, or Coleco. The F-16 Fighting Falcon game was back then, given the limited things you had to work with, I would say was, was very, very realistic for the time. And if you went back and played it now, I think you'd have the same feeling. And Fantasy Star, a role-playing game filled with solid quests and masterful stories. I think at the time, Fantasy Star was was a fairly different type of kind of RPG, and I, I don't think we can say that now, you know, but the games coming out, you know, a lot of them are, seem to be similar, or a lot of the things that borrow concepts from, from one another, but I think back then it was just very fresh. Made you want to play it over and over again. Fantasy Star 2 is released in 1989 and features an inventive storyline and realistic graphics with the power of Sega's new 16-bit console, the Genesis. I was clearly a Genesis guy. If it weren't for the Genesis, I wouldn't even be in the video game industry. Nintendo releases their own console, the Super NES, and a rivalry is born. Yeah, the 16-bit console wars, I mean, that was a sort of a famous era in video games, because you had Nintendo kind of unwilling to release a successor to the NES. They didn't want to shoot that golden goose that was already still laying golden eggs. And unfortunately for them, that gave Sega just kind of a very small challenger, an opportunity to, like, come in with a Genesis. For the Super NES, Nintendo introduces a series of games featuring Mario, created by Shigeru Miyamoto. The series becomes wildly popular. Naka begins collaborating with character designer Oshima and has an idea he hopes can compete with the little plumber. To come up with the character of Sonic, we asked ourselves what kind of game do we want to make? Back then, Mario existed and he jumped a lot, jumping and hitting blocks. But what I wanted to do was get involved with creating a smoother surface to run across and have the character run fast. I was the main programmer. The most important thing was I wanted it to be playful. 
so we built characters to match the playfulness. The result is Sonic the Hedgehog, released in 1991. And the Sonic team is formed, led by its creator. Since I'm the president of Sonic Team, I'm involved in every aspect. The visuals, story, and gameplay. I believe the games must represent Sonic Team in a good way. The Sonic Team is determined to make Sonic stand out in the crowd. Well, blast processing was like the marketing term for Sonic the Hedgehog, and you know it was allegedly something that somehow made Sonic the Hedgehog go faster. Was it ever more than a marketing term? I don't think so. So, who knows? But it definitely worked good in the ads. But I still remember it. Blast processing. I thought it conveyed the sense of speed a lot better than even some racing games did. It was probably one of the most perfect. 2D characters has ever been invented. So in comes Sega with Sonic, and he is a character who is a little hedgehog guy, and he's blue, but he has all this attitude. He doesn't stop for nobody. He's just like spinning and going really fast through the levels. This guy is much faster than Mario. Mario is the old man. Undoubtedly, I think Sonic was a system seller for Sega. As a mascot back then, it was just huge. And it's just the beginning. By 1992, Sonic the Hedgehog is a success, selling 2 million units. Gamers and critics alike are impressed with Sonic's revolutionary speed and spin dash and the inevitable comparisons begin. I was involved with Sonic for a long time, but as soon as Mario appeared, the comparisons began. It became Nintendo versus Sega that the media wanted to compare. And, uh, and Sega decided, well, Nintendo has the kid audience. We'll go after the, the teenage audience. We'll, we'll really bring them in with these, these cool ninja games and these really mature things. That Yeah, there's not nudity or swearing or, or extreme violence, but they're, they're really edgy. Sega at that time introduced some really innovative marketing, kind of like the shock tactics marketing that just had never been done in games before. It was amazing. And every player, you know, nobody had two consoles. You know, everybody had one or the other, and you're either a Sega fan or a Super Nintendo fan. And you either said, like, Sonic sucks and Mario rules, or Sonic rules and Mario sucks. Sega really capitalized on that, that whole, you know, speed feel and said, this guy is much faster than Mario. And it worked. In the US, the Genesis outsold the Super Nintendo, which was amazing, based on the success of games like Sonic. But Naka simply shrugs it off. The contents of the game and the direction, those were totally different. So as far as I'm concerned, the comparison was wrong, and I think that was a misunderstanding. I don't want there to be anything bad between us, so while we are in good terms, and if I can work on not keeping a distance, that would be great. We are good friends. Naka quickly goes to work on a sequel and heads west to collaborate with American development teams. From 1991 to 1994, I lived in San Francisco. Naka worked with art director Tim Skelly. I managed the American artists who were kind of trying to keep this, you know, the styles coordinated. The first Sonic had a special stage, and they wanted to do one for this one. Naka came up with this really interesting code for being able to take a sprite engine and do bitmap graphics with it. So I came up with this ramp you know, that would go around this half shell, you know, the half circle, you know, and so I did the, all the artwork for the, for the moving background and for the, you know, the curving ramps and, you know, and all that. In 1992, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is released and Sonic gets a sidekick. Once again, Sonic scores with audiences and becomes synonymous with game giant Sega. Sonic appears on other systems for Sega, like the Sega CD. With Sonic, I think there's also the attitude. I think that helps a lot. And being the first, you know, it's easy to copy, but, you know, like Elvis is Elvis, you know, and you gotta go with that. And I think that has a lot to do with, you know, the success of Sonic. 
And they've been pretty careful about, you know, protecting, you know, the character. By 1994, Naka returns to Japan to work on more games, like Fantasy Star 4, End of the Millennium. And Sonic the Hedgehog 3 is released with a new character, Knuckles. Meanwhile, the Sega CD isn't faring so well. I think you have to just make things easy for the, for the consumer. And it just wasn't a very easy piece. It was just not, I don't think, holistically thought out. Bottom line is it wasn't easy for the consumer. And hopes are high in 1995 when Sega introduces the Saturn, its 32-bit console, to compete with the Nintendo 64 and Mario. Well, Nintendo had, you know, Mario, this short, stubby plumber that, you know, walked around at a brisk pace and, and jumped on Goombas and, you know, flung turtle shells. And, and Sega had the, the differing opinion. But in Sonic's just zooming through levels. And as Sonic progressed, that's what he got more into, was just going through at lightning fast speeds. All these amazing looking levels that you didn't ever get to admire, you didn't ever get to, to take in the beauty of them. You know, like, yeah, the, the speed was impressive. Even more impressive are other games Naka and Sonic Team create. Like Knights in 1996. Yeah, I know that Knights is a, is, is a cult favorite amongst a lot of a lot of uh, gamers and developers alike. Sega launches a reported $10 million campaign behind its 3D answer to Mario 64. Although Knights gets great reviews, the buzz doesn't translate into sales. I saw it as the first time I was kind of aware that games could be art as well as just a, you know, piece of entertainment or, you know, kind of a toy. Sonic Team consists of only 100 people. Even if we want to come up with a sequel, there's so many other products we have to create, and I guess Knights is suffering. But then I'm not thinking, never again. It's not like if I had the chance, I wouldn't make it. The new Knights proposal, we came up with that, and we have been consulting, but we haven't made a final decision or determination. More Sonic games follow, and in 1998, Sonic Team tries something new with Burning Rangers, an elite search and rescue team equipped to handle life-threatening missions. Despite best efforts by Naka and his team, the Saturn succumbs to the Sony PlayStation. Well, it's unfashionable to say luck. I don't think it's a lot of luck involved, but I think market timing was really right for Sony at the time, and they put out a superior offering, clearly. You know, more people just bought their system. But don't count Sonic out just yet, as he shows up in the unlikeliest of places. Huh? Tails, I'm just glad you're okay. Thanks, but you gotta check out my newest power supply. Ta-da! By September 1999, Sega reinvigorates its dwindling console business with the introduction of the Dreamcast, and expectations are high. I think they had a chance. I mean, I used to say, even before I was at the Dreamcast magazine, and if you just look at the launch titles that are coming out for Dreamcast, it's worth it to buy it just to get the, you know, the best 10 launch titles. Like Sonic Adventure, and for the first time, Sonic is in full 3D. I think Sonic was the perfect character for the 2D world, and the way the game was designed. I think Mario probably had a little bit more longevity in the 3D world, or at least, you know, I mean, we were in love with Mario before, but when Mario 64 came out, we really fell in love with Mario. The 3D brought a whole other aspect to him that made his character so much more complex than it was as a 2D character. I think the same can be said about Sonic in, in when he moved from 2D to 3D. The Dreamcast was an awesome system. They had awesome games coming out for years. And Naka certainly delivers. In 2000, he delights his fans with Choo Choo Rocket. Samba de Amigo! And the maraca shaking Samba de Amigo. <laughs> Fantasy Star Online is released in 2001. It is the first global, massively multiplayer online console RPG. I was working on the Dreamcast hardware and I thought, how can we bring the biggest audience to this game? 
Of course, online games are then and still now for hardcore players. But the enjoyment of online games needs to be easier for people to access. So we kind of lowered the bar so everyone can enjoy it. Fantasy Star Online. That was actually my first foray into the, the whole massive multiplayer universe. Like, yeah, it's not as big as I request. It was just four players, but it was addicting. It was crack. Someone's got to be a pioneer, and I'm glad that Yuji Naka and uh, PSO was th the first of those type of games to prove that the market was there for these things to exist, and I think more and more people are going to start exploring the online console realm. But sadly, it's not enough to revive Sega's failing console business. Although Sonic Adventure 2 is released in 2001, it fails to bring the Dreamcast up to speed with the competition. The Dreamcast was actually kind of a bit ahead of its time. It was, it was a great machine. I mean, graphically, architecture was really nice to program for. It had a modem in it. But I think the specter of the PlayStation 2 just kind of suppressed the Dreamcast enough that it never really got its legs going underneath it. But on its own merits, if, if it operated, if it were a vacuum, if the market were a vacuum, Dreamcast, Dreamcast would have been a great product. The sort of lack of long-term success of the Dreamcast was kind of a disappointment. In some ways, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, publishers sort of thought, well, the Dreamcast isn't going to be here in, in two years, so I better just move on. And, you know, and because the publishers moved on, the Dreamcast wasn't there. When the Dreamcast went away, I, I think Sega immediately thought they were, and they, they felt behind because they never had any experience working on other systems. But there are formidable talent there and a lot of creative people who I think will only bring the company to newer and bigger heights as, as a software maker. And that's exactly what they do. Naka and Sonic Team bring his memorable characters to the new hardware systems. Hey, you will not believe this new GameCube. It's so wild. Over the last 20 years, I've been involved in developing games. During that time, Nintendo has been our rival. And I thought one of these days, will the games I create be played on Nintendo? And then after Sega moved away from hardware, I thought about this all along, just after Dreamcast went away. And soon after, Nintendo GameCube was introduced. I began to create for that. So we focused on the GameCube. Like Sonic Adventure 2 Battle for the GameCube. That same year, Fantasy Star Online 1 and 2 are released for both the GameCube and Xbox. Huh? Sonic Heroes was released in 2004. I think everyone was a bit shocked at first that, that Nintendo and Sega had finally joined forces since they were mortal enemies for 10, 15 years. In a roundabout sense, it all makes sense now. And now they've realized, well, we're, we're better off doing things like Sonic and making games like F-Zero, so I think it's a good team. You know, Sonic was meant to be for everyone, and, and you know, I guess it's just apropos that he's on all, all the platforms now. Well, Miyamoto in various media interviews has said he likes my work, and I'm very happy to hear that. In the world of games, he is almost a god. So when someone like that praises a game I worked on, I'm really happy to hear that. Please join me in honoring Yuji Naka. In 2002, Yuji Naka is awarded for his contribution to the game industry by his peers. He's given the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award from the IGDA at the second annual Game Developers' Choice Awards. I would like to thank Sega, who has granted me the freedom and the resources to make my visions a reality. And I remember when um, Nakasan received his award that night, um, he was literally skipping, like back to the hotel. It's rare to see a grown man skip, but I remember one of his assistants telling me, how, you know, I've never seen him this happy you know, in his life. That challenged me to do good work and there's also always been an emphasis on innovation. I mean, people don't think of it now, but at the time, games like Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic 2 were incredibly innovative, you know, blast processing. Samba de Amigo and, and Fantasy Star Online and Choo Choo, you know, above all Sonic, I think they've made an indelible impression and really contributed culturally to what video games are as an art form. I'd like to thank the gamers, because after all, that is what this industry is really about. 
think developers recognize how innovative and how forward-thinking Yuji Naka and his team are and how much they've contributed to our industry. He has lots of childlike qualities, which I think translates into his games. Like any great creator, he's always looking about the next place he can bring his art and raise his game. Really brought our industry where it is today and hopefully bring it into the future too. I'm now the senior director of the creative department of Sega. I oversee development in many areas. I'd like to change. I'd like to move forward.